She was a woman, she was an English woman, she was a bossy English woman. This Scottish miracle didn't happen by accident. She was a woman who was just, she was, she was such a megalomaniac. I hope to go on and on. It's very difficult, I think, for anyone in Scotland today to say that Margaret Thatcher was a positive force. The message is, Mr. President, that Tory philosophy works when we have the courage to put it into practice and the perseverance to see it through. This talk of the naked individual, of greed being good, of, of if you sort out your own family and your own private concerns, society will look after itself. I think people just thought that was nonsense. Discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. Would a time traveller from 1979 recognise Scotland today? We used to have steelworks, now we have Starbucks. Mrs Thatcher might have rewritten the prayer of St Francis. Where there were shipyards, may we bring banking. Where there were coal mines, may we bring business parks. Where there was hard work and honest industry, may we bring retail. Scotland 30 years ago rejected her again and again, but it couldn't stop her one-woman revolution. Look around you now, and what you see is the land that Maggie built. But there was one revolution that she didn't want, but which she couldn't stop either. Scotland, in response to Hurricane Maggie, asserted itself in a new way. She didn't mean to, but she loosened the ties that bound the Anglo-Scottish Union. She let the genie of Scottish national aspiration out of the 300-year-old bottle of British sovereignty. And we haven't heard the end of it yet. When you think of the Thatcher years, you think above all of the dole queues, the mass unemployment, the industrial dereliction, and the despair of it all. But look at Scotland today. It's a different place. It's more prosperous than it was even in the current economic downturn. It has its own parliament, and Edinburgh's more of a national capital than it's been for 300 years. Scotland never voted for Margaret Thatcher, and she remains unforgiven here. It's as though we built her into our national mythology as a kind of wicked stepmother who came to us uninvited and remains unloved. But isn't it time to go beyond the myths and to look again at what those years revealed about us as a country and at the changed Scotland they bequeathed to us? Thatcher deplored Britain in decline. She blamed the trade unions. She blamed high public spending. She blamed big government. Her promise to wage war on all three and to put the great back into Britain chimed with the popular mood. At least in most of England it did. And Scotland was not yet all that different. Margaret Thatcher was not as radical when she became Prime Minister as she subsequently became. Not because she didn't have the instincts or the potential, but because the objectives in 1979 were relatively modest to deal with inflation, to try and bring some order to the trade union situation, and to help give a kickstart to the economy through the private sector. Inflation was taking off again. In short, we were a nation which all too plainly had lost its way and almost abandoned hope of ever finding it again. I don't think even Margaret Thatcher realised, or any of us realised, was once you start that process, if you've got the guts to do it and if you've got a bit of imagination, actually you could create a whole new economy. And by the effectiveness of its persuasion of the electorate... Every revolution has its vanguard of ideologues. In Scotland, a group of young Tory radicals championed free market capitalism and challenged the genial old moderates then in charge of the Scottish Conservative Party. If anything, the younger and more radical elements in the party were being encouraged at that time. Because the Scottish Tory establishment was a load of old fuddy-duddies, uh, who just rejected all new ideas, uh, there really did seem to be a, a chance to adopt radical ideas that would appeal to the Scottish people, that were, would not be seen simply as an imposition from England. <laughs> 
Mrs Thatcher had made a clean break with the consensual politics of her predecessor, Edward Heath. Suddenly, Labour found that it was the real small-c Conservative Party, defending the status quo against a radical reforming Prime Minister. I guess that the, it was going to be very bad uh, indeed, uh, worse than the Ted Heath years, for example, because Ted Heath, by Thatcher's standards, was a, a moderate, whereas uh, Thatcher was a, a, a right-wing extremist in economic terms as well as in social terms. So, yes, I, I feared the worst. The narrative that I was brought up with was that once there was an evil world in which the state didn't look after people and in which people could starve to death, it was the world recorded by Charles Dickens and all the rest of it, where there was no national health service, where education was dependent on your ability to pay for it. Um, I was brought up to think of these things, and I don't think wrongly, as evident evils. And I was brought up to think that the British welfare state of the post-war period had resolved that and had determined to create a society in which these evils would no longer exist. So I was actually quite viscerally shocked when I met this kind of flying wedge of people who thought that the welfare state was a bad thing, an evil thing, and ought to be um, rolled back and ought to be replaced by a much more rigorous set of market disciplines. The welfare state wasn't all they wanted to roll back. They also put an end to the Tories' long-standing commitment to a Scottish Assembly. No sound or honourable basis for the great constitutional change which Labour have proposed. And the final insult would be for this dying government to try to bend our constitution to keep themselves in power for a few more wretched weeks. One of the first things that she did when she came into power was to repeal uh, the legislation setting up the, the Scottish uh, Assembly and that cleared the decks, uh, as it were, uh, for her to impose policies uh, on the people of Scotland against the will of the people of Scotland. Some people say that we're not a Scottish party, but neither are we an English party, nor a Welsh party, nor an Irish party. We're the party of the whole United Kingdom. Mrs Thatcher's war on the old economy was about to change Scotland forever. Market forces prepared to do battle with state subsidy right here in Motherwell. Government, not the market, had brought the Ravenscraig steelworks to Scotland. It was the linchpin of Scottish industry, the towering symbol of post-war economic planning. State planning, that is. And the state arranged for it to buy coal from the state-owned mines and to sell steel to the state-aided car manufacturers and shipyards. The steelworkers took on the new government almost immediately. They went on strike in 1980 for higher wages. And they won. Their 19% pay rise was a red rag to the Thatcherite bull. State-owned British steel was now losing £2 billion a year. How the Thatcherites hated all that. Ravenscraig came to stand for all that was wrong with Britain in decline. Its days and that of an old and settled idea of what Scotland was were now numbered. The steelworks that once stood here operated around the clock, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, without pause for decades. This is where those famous cooling towers once stood. It pulled in generation after generation of school leavers and kept them for life, turning them into a highly skilled industrial workforce. It was a pillar of Scotland's whole economy. That's why the battle to save it became symbolic of something much bigger. It became a fight for a certain conception of Scotland itself, of what Scotland should be. And when you ask yourself who won that battle, take a look at what's here now. You would hardly know that there had ever been industrial activity at all. The largest industrial site in Scotland greened over in the battle against state subsidy. How did it happen? In Scotland, more than in England, uh, we were uh, dependent on the large, heavy, nationalised industries, all of which were technically bankrupt, all of which were dependent on handout by government, all of which were inefficient, overmanned and subject to trade union militancy. And it was inevitable that those industries could not survive at the size at which they were. They had to be reduced in size and that was what happened. 
perhaps the Scottish economy was over reliant on these heavy industries and there was a need perhaps to reduce the number of people employed uh, in these industries. Uh, but to say that these industries should be completely annihilated, I don't think it makes economic sense. And the pace of change was such that you had thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, thrown out of work. The Tories, in rising to the battle, knew they were taking on public opinion, knew they were courting unpopularity. Sometimes it's presented as if this was a conscious decision, that somehow you know, ministers put on hair shirts and said it's going to be terribly painful and so forth. Uh, and of course there's an element of that. You, if you're going to do something difficult, uh, then uh, if it wasn't going to hurt, then it would have been done years ago. You know, politicians actually quite like to be popular, and therefore they don't opt to do things that they know will be difficult and painful and unpopular, unless they believe it profoundly to be in the national uh, interest. So that was always going to be a difficult problem. It in, in, in political terms, it was always going to be a more difficult problem in Scotland and in Wales because the Conservative Party did not have the same political strength. The price they paid in public support didn't deter them. One by one, Scotland's industrial giants failed the test the government and the market set for them. In 1981, Persia Talbot closed its Linwood plant, perhaps 13,000 livelihoods gone. Ravenscraig lost one of its biggest customers. Then the Invergordon aluminium smelter and the Corpuch pulp mill, both vital employers for the Highlands, both now swept away. In 1985, British Leyland at Bathgate was no more, and with it the assembly of heavy trucks in Scotland. Linwood, Bathgate, then the Gartkosh steel mill. The names worked their way into protest songs and popular consciousness. As Hurricane Maggie swept through, all Scotland, it seemed, was shutting up shop. And Scotland began to feel the tug of an old sentiment, that of victimhood. It didn't accept the economic rationale of it. Ravenscraig had the lowest man earth per tonne figure in the whole of British Steel, which meant that we were the most successful plant in British Steel. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, 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 the plans of British Steel was certainly to close Ravenscraig eventually, and they, they were trying everything they could do, they could to, to do that. But they had to take away the economic argument from us, and we still had the economic argument up until uh, Garkos went. We were at the centre of, of, of world manufacture. Uh, in what we were doing, uh, and aided, of course, by the by the oil industry, uh, you know. So we had a real chance uh, at that stage to take those industries forward, rather than a, uh, a, to close them down. And and, and I used to um, get upset about uh, people that you would have known who were big men in the steel industry in Lanarkshire, working in, in the furnaces. Um, in their own locality, they were big people being just cast onto the scrap heap. And uh, so it, 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 Scotland's sense of itself, of its skills, of its, uh, what Scotland was about, was around those industries. At Ravenscraig, the fight went on. Workers walked in forlorn protest from Motherwell to Downing Street, evoking the hungry 1930s and the glory days of labour history. It didn't work. Mrs. Thatcher refused to see them. Ravenscraig gave up the ghost in 1992. Do you think Scotland was being discriminated against? The Scottish steel industry was being discriminated against. Scotland in general, I don't know. Somebody else could put that argument forward. But the Scottish steel industry was certainly being discriminated against. They destroyed an excellent plant at Ravenscraig. That belief that Mrs Thatcher was deliberately and unnecessarily laying waste to Scottish industry became widespread, part of the tale that Scotland told itself. But wasn't she simply blamed for a process that was taking place globally and even before she came to power? A lot of these things were happening anyway and the political flux had started before she came on the scene. In some ways what she did was to crystallise the issue 
and to start talking about things like uh, the need for trade union reform, uh, the need for you know, a, a more liberal market approach to uh, uh, managing the economy, um, about people changing attitudes, your old entrenched attitudes. Um, that was being thrown up anyway because the old way of life was crumbling around people's ears anyway. Had both sides of industry only realised that in future they had to take responsibility for their own actions and that they would not automatically be bailed out regardless of their performance, hundreds of thousands of worthwhile jobs would have survived the recession. She was accused of turning Scotland into a desert. All she was doing was clearing away the debris of what was already a desert on a life support machine, and the life support machine was one fed by taxation pumped in by the Westminster government. It couldn't go on. And this was the narrative that began, gradually at first, to fix itself in the English imagination, that of the surly, brooding, taciturn, reform-resistant Scot, and of Scotland a subsidy junkie, addicted to and paralysed by subsidy from the dynamic, wealth-creating South. Why did England and Scotland come to such radically different points of view? They had not been the benefits of Thatcherism in Scotland. Because the Scottish establishment had been so sluggish in accepting Thatcherism, there had been no privatisations in Scotland. There was no privatisation in Scotland before 1987. There were not uh, working class people uh, with shares in their pockets, uh, watching the, the value of those shares rise uh, and feeling richer uh, all of a sudden. Uh, popular Thatcherism had not come to Scotland. And so, there was nothing offsetting the pain. A political identity had mapped itself onto the landscape of old industrial Scotland. Communities that knew they owed their livelihoods to something called British Steel were naturally suspicious of the SNP, a party that wanted to break up the very state that paid the wages. And when the industrial landscape changes, the politics will surely follow. It's taken years, but the redevelopment of this site has begun at last. And the Ravenscraig that future generations of school leavers will inherit will be quite different. Hundreds of private new homes are being built. There's to be a huge regional sports centre and the gleaming glass towers of a college of further education. There's to be a new town centre with shops and bars and restaurants and a new business park. That is what is covering over the old industrial Scotland. And as that old Scotland recedes into the distant memory, so too do many of the certainties that came with it. Those rock-solid labour-voting communities that owed their livelihoods to the nationalised industries of the post-war British state, gone. And with them, many of the settled political and national loyalties that they sustained. In politics, perception is everything. Personality is as important as policy. And in personality, Mrs. Thatcher packed quite a punch. There was just something about Maggie that played to Scotland's less admirable instincts. She was just so grandly, aggressively, self-confidently, irritatingly and irredeemably southern. She touched the raw nerve of Scotland's capacity for anti-Englishness. She was a woman, she was an English woman, she was a bossy English woman. And they could probably have put up with one or possibly even two of these, but all three simultaneously, a bit too much. Uh, her style just grated. Partly the voice, partly the, the priorities, uh, but partly also this extraordinary, able and impressive woman. Uh, there were certain things that she couldn't comprehend. For example, here is this great British patriot deeply suspicious of the European dimension and determined to protect Britain's identity against Europe but find it very difficult to see that within the United Kingdom there was a similar relationship Scotland to England as she was seeking to protect Britain to, to Europe. It's not that she couldn't understand it, she couldn't empathize with it. I went along to her room in the, in the House of Commons and uh, um, it was amusing in some respects because uh, she allowed me to 
say my piece about the need for this engineering workshops to remain open because the people of Scotland were still very dependent upon uh, public uh, transport and the skilled workers in that workshops were good, doing a good job, etc. Um, and um, having said my piece, she then uh, gave her reply. She said, Mr. Canavan, um, I understand your concern about the high unemployment in Falkirk. I said, Prime Minister, it's not Falkirk, it's Falkirk. She said, oh, Falkirk, Falkirk, what does it matter? I mean, here was a woman who was just, she, had, she was such a megalomaniac, she actually thought she had the power to change the pronunciation of Scottish place names. It's not that Mrs Thatcher didn't try to connect with Scottish sentiment. She wanted the people on her side, wanted to belong in Scotland as much as she did in England. In one infamous television exchange, she tried perhaps too hard. I and Michael Forsyth uh, were briefing her beforehand, and I said to her, you know, Margaret, when you're being interviewed, try not to... I, I've often heard when you're in Scotland, you talk about you in Scotland do this, you in Scotland do that. I said, it sounds as if you're visiting another country, you know, you, you're Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Try not to use that phrase. He said, absolutely, good point. Absolutely, I will remember that. Thank you very much. Uh, it looks from the latest figures as if we in Scotland are going to have higher growth than uh, the people further south. Michael and I were watching on the monitor and suddenly we heard her saying, we in Scotland. And the first time we thought about, you know, nobody will notice. She said it two or three times. We in Scotland, we in Scotland. You know? I was very perturbed at the last election that we in Scotland hadn't quite had the full benefit of the increasing number of jobs that there were. There are two points, one which applies to us in Scotland just as much as, as it does elsewhere. What will happen uh, uh, down south is the same thing that's happened to us in Scotland. And I thought, God, this extraordinary woman who's so brilliant and so able in so many ways, she understood the problem I'd been trying to tell her. She didn't appreciate the solution was infinitely worse. And, you know, that was the, the difficulty we had from time to time. That personality, the voice, the manner became totemic. Many in Scotland began to see them as distinctive of a set of values. Values that were expressly English, that somehow ran contrary to a different and sometimes hostile set of values that were Scots. And it wasn't just the anti-Thatcher left that worried about it. She was English and she was on their wavelength. She wasn't on the Scottish wavelength, I don't think. The Scots that she was on a wavelength with were Adam Smith and David Hume. But they were dead, they didn't have a vote. And they didn't have much influence on everyday Scots. And Scotland is a more consensual place. There is less uh, of an us and them attitude in, in society in Scotland. Um, I think Scotland is more of a village uh, in, in many ways. It's a smaller country and uh, I don't think that she, her, her, what she said, and indeed the manner in which she said it, came across uh, so favourably in Scotland as it did in the South. And this puzzled her, because she admired many of the qualities of Scots. She shared them, uh, self-reliance, thrift, all the things that had made Scotland uh, a great country in many ways. Um, but she didn't quite understand the extent to which Scotland was in, in thrall to socialism and the dependency culture. It was more deep-rooted than she realised. It wasn't that people perhaps were anti-English, just like that. But aspects of Englishness got on people's nerves increasingly in that decade. As I say, it was a voice which reminded people, um, this is Thatcher's voice. People really hated that voice. You know, they shuddered, turned the radio off. You can say, yes, it was something to do with an ethnic distaste. Time and again, the Scottish ministerial team have richly earned the collective title, which I believe some jealous Sassanacs imposed upon them, that of the Tartan Mafia. <laughs> But I must say that George Younger makes a most benevolent godfather. <laughs> Lots of the people who were essentially the public face of the Conservative Party in Scotland, folk like George Younger, Alec Buchanan-Smith, Malcolm Rifkin, were seen as very much on the patrician or paternalist wing 
of the Conservative Party. And they presented themselves to, to Scottish media opinion as essentially Scotland's protectors against what some people might have seen in Scotland as the, as the wilder excesses of Thatcherism. So George Younger made great play of the fact that he was the defender of Ravenscraig, the defender of Scotland's industrial virility against Margaret Thatcher. But one of the consequences of that was that people got the impression that somehow Margaret Thatcher and the ideas that she stood for were inimical to Scottish values, and therefore Scottish conservatism could only survive by holding Thatcherism at bay rather than by adapting Thatcherism to Scottish contours. And so when even Scotland's conservative leaders were perceived as having to protect Scotland from Mrs Thatcher, something quite dangerous was happening to the union she loved. The old British politics of left versus right, Labour versus Tory, the state versus the market, were giving way to something new, England versus Scotland, with the Conservative Party being seen more and more as the English party, with a set of values that weren't just alien, but actively hostile to what Scotland wanted. And so places like this, prosperous, aspirational, home-owning, natural Tory territory almost anywhere else in Britain, and which had been happily Tory in the past, now turned away from the Conservative Party. Why, though? Was Scotland really more left-wing than England? More compassionate, less aspirational, less concerned with private wealth? There's no firm evidence that Scotland was any of these things. So why were England and Scotland now voting so differently? There were three things uh, operating, in my view. The first is the significant numbers of um, middle-class and professional Scots uh, who were employed in the public sector and who feared very much for their position, for their jobs. Uh, a second factor was that by the time you get to the late 1980s, there is a sense of an awareness, if you like, of the extraordinary damage done uh, to Scotland, or at least to the old industrial structure of Scotland, by uh, this particular um, regime. And I think the third factor is that the, the heavy industry in Scotland and everything that went with it was actually a badge of identity. And th there was also developing awareness that whatever the rationality of these economic policies from the late 1970s and early 1980s. There was an awareness, I think, that the whole thing was handled far too rigorously with too little sensitivity for Scottish opinion. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. For Britishness, that familiar left-right battleground had one last big fight in it. In 1984, Britain's miners went on strike. There was no Scottish national dimension to this. The Scottish miners were in the same fight for the same ends against the same enemy as their comrades in Yorkshire, Nottinghamshire and South Wales. Well, it was a great mood of optimism at the start of the miners' strike that um, the miners could strike a blow for their own industry, the protection of their own industry. That's what it was. It was unlike most of the previous strikes which had been about uh, wages. This one was really a strike about the survival of the coal industry and miners de decided uh, that uh, they had no option but to take strike action to try and save the coal industry in Scotland but the cost in social terms and in economic terms turned out to be appalling. I think as miners are, you know, when they go down and face the conditions they worked in, it made them stronger because they knew they had to rely on each other. And I think the community showed that as well. And that was the strength that came out in the face of adversity. That when we knew we were being challenged our very existence, that it actually strengthened us in a way and made us more determined to fight for that. It was the last great political rising of a united British working class movement, the closing chapter in the story of this kind of organised labour. It had been a long and illustrious tale of solidarity, sacrifice and progress. That story had become a key component of Britain's shared national narrative, part of what had moulded the Britons we all were. Mrs Thatcher sent it back to work, defeated and demoralised. In retrospect, you had a very intransigent Prime Minister who was hell-bent uh, 
on A, destroying the National Union of Mine Workers and teaching a lesson to the rest of the trade union movement, and B, she was hell-bent on destroying the coal industry. There's no doubt about it in my mind that once she defeated the miners, then the confidence of other parts of the, the movement were certainly affected by that. Didn't mean to say people didn't fight, they did fight. But I think that had, if it had went the other way, then the whole of history would have changed in this country. At the time of the strike, the National Union of Mine Workers had 15,000 members in Scotland. Today there are just 70 left. The British Labour movement, with its pantheon of working class heroes and its proud tradition of organised struggle, was one of the pillars of Britishness. If you were a Scottish miner, being part of all this connected you very powerfully to Derbyshire and Yorkshire and South Wales. It pulled you in and made you identify very strongly with a community of interest that was absolutely British. When Mrs Thatcher defeated the miners, all that was swept away. Part of what bound us all together as fellow Britons with shared traditions and causes in common slipped into history. But the dereliction of the old industries was misleading, for elsewhere Scotland was getting better off. Mrs Thatcher's dream was of a property-owning democracy. She wanted us all to own the homes we lived in. Far more people in Scotland lived in council houses than in England. More than half Scottish homes were public sector. Mrs Thatcher changed the law to allow council tenants to buy. Scots might not have voted for that, but they bought all the same. It wasn't the only way in which individual Scots benefited from policies they persistently voted against. As a result of what she did to reduce taxation, to uh, bring trade union militancy under control uh, and to make the United Kingdom a more attractive place to invest in, we were able, I and my predecessors as Secretary of State, were able to go abroad on trade missions and we brought in inward investment in tens of thousands of jobs, new industries, well-paid jobs, uh, plugging into our academic uh, excellence at our universities um, and it was a transformation of Scotland. Well, people got better off. Um, I mean, I think, I think that's the most obvious physical manifestation of the change. Uh, I mean, out of that long period of uh, despair and, and decline, you know, people found that there were other ways of making a living. You went through the despair and then you kind of looked around and more people were going to Spain on holiday and more people were doing this and more people were doing that and supermarkets had exotic food in them and, you know, you could get strawberries in December and all these other things uh, began to happen. Um, and you thought, well, you know, maybe, you know, we've begun to see the uplands on the other side of this deep uh, depression. Yet despite those holidays in Spain, those berries in midwinter, in the election of 1987, the Tory vote in Scotland fell off a cliff. They lost more than half their MPs, but they won again in England. Three times in a row, Scotland had rejected the Conservatives at the ballot box, and three times in a row, they stayed in power anyway. The national question, who has the right to run Scotland, which had been quietly put to sleep in 1979, was back. I remember very early on I was at a social gathering uh, involving uh, senior civil servants in the Scottish office and um, the uh, then permanent secretary was sort of quite keen to find out what was I thinking. So he said to me, what's the big issue, what do you see the big issue uh, is going to be in the period ahead? And I said, um, the question of the democratic structure in Scotland, the, the, the right of Scotland to uh, be able to make most of the important decisions uh, um, in Scotland. And he said, mm, he said, maybe I'll better dust off the, uh, the file and, um, and, and, and have a look at it. Um, so even the permanent secretary of the Scottish office at that stage, and, and that's maybe 1986, um, had not thought uh, that uh, the issue would come back uh, um, very soon. This is where the old Scottish Parliament met in the 17th and early 18th centuries. And not far from here is the old Royal High School, which was to have housed 
the new devolved assembly that the Labour government of the 1970s tried and failed to set up. So it came to be said that Scotland was the only country in Europe that had two parliament buildings and no parliament. In the 1980s, this missing parliament came to be known as the democratic deficit. And more and more people in Scotland argued that conservative policies were not just unpopular, they were actually illegitimate in a country that had repeatedly voted against them in elections. And the idea began to take hold among anti-Tory Scots that Scotland wasn't just a separate political realm, it was a separate moral realm as well. More caring, more egalitarian, less acquisitive, less, in a word, Tory. I think uh, within Scotland there always has been and to an extent there still is, although it's perhaps diluted, eroded now to some extent, uh, a strong sense of social justice, of communal responsibility, of civil society, the, the kind of feature of a, a kind of small country um, looking out for one another. And there was a poll the other day which looked at attitudes towards things like equality, personal freedom, and so on. And they could register no difference at all between the English and the Scots, almost none. Uh, nevertheless, if you put it in a kind of national context, you throw a light of how do you as a Scot feel about this, that, and the other, then it begins to change. I mean, what certainly is true is that uh, Scotland has a much greater belief in the importance of equality in Mrs. Thatcher's third term, these ideas of the democratic deficit and of Scotland's moral distinctness welded themselves into a force that almost the whole of Scotland could rally round. The political parties, the local authorities, the churches, the trade unions, civil society, everyone except the governing party, united to form a constitutional convention. Home rule, dormant for nearly a decade, was up and out again. The clamour of Mrs. Thatcher's third consecutive election victory in England and the discord of a third consecutive defeat in Scotland had shaken it awake. All the Labour MPs, all the Liberal Democrat MPs, they all went to the founding meeting of the Constitutional Convention and said, thus far and no further. And I mean, if you look at the image of that meeting now, I mean, everyone, I mean, the politicians, civil society, everybody except the Conservatives at the founding meeting, the SNP were there as well, um, saying, we cannot have this anymore. But argument was Mrs. Thatcher's stock in trade, and she brought it with her to the closest thing Scotland had to a parliament of its own, the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. This, the church with no bishops, no hierarchy, with its core doctrine that everyone, no matter how grand you think yourself, is equal before God, this was the Scottish egalitarian ideal in sober, judgmental flesh and blood. And in May 1988, Mrs. Thatcher, the champion of the right to be unequal, now came to address it. Take the Good Samaritan, she said. He wasn't just kind, he was only able to help because he was also rich. This was Thatcherism, finding not just moral, but scriptural authority. But it's not the creation of wealth that is wrong, but love of money for its own sake. The spiritual dimension comes in deciding what one does with the wealth. How could we respond to the many calls for help, or invest for the future, or support the wonderful artists and craftsmen whose work also glorifies God, unless we had first worked hard and used our talents to create the necessary wealth. She explained the difference between society and community. She regarded society as an abstract, um, identifiable with socialism. She regarded community as what was important, individuals coming together in the community. She had very strong views about that. Um, and the way she explained it uh, made it perfectly clear that um, she was very sincere about the importance of a community and people playing their part in the community, helping others, working together. Um, but that wasn't the way she was portrayed. I leave you with that earnest hope that may we all come nearer to that other country whose ways are ways of gentleness and all her paths are peace. What she said um, was uh, an attempt to justify um, her her policies and and it was very much focused on individual choice and there was there was very little sense of any 
um, wider concern for the well-being of society. It became known as the Sermon on the Mound. It was in fact a careful, thoughtful assertion that Thatcherism and Christian compassion were compatible. Indeed, that real compassion was only possible where there was wealth in the first place to distribute to the needy. But that is not what Scotland heard. While it was a good exposition of why capitalism was compatible with Christianity in, a, in an abstract sense, I think it, uh, it bore little uh, relation uh, you know, to the social gospel that had been preached for all through the 20th century uh, by the Church of Scotland. Uh, it showed little appreciation of the fact that, in my view, the Church of Scotland uh, today has not much to do with religion, but is really a, a, a large social work department. Um, these were the kind of nuances about Scotland that were completely inaccessible to her, uh, and she didn't realise what she was coming up against in the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, so she got it wrong. Here's the, the a Prime Minister that's coming, and she's, she's not got the mood right. She's, and, and she doesn't understand, if you like. I mean, this, this was a demonstration. This was evidence of, that there was, a, there was a gap. There was a, a, both a conscience and a consciousness gap, as it were, between Scotland and, and England. Even at the time, it seemed to be an emblematic moment, the moment at which two distinct philosophies had been thrown into sharp relief. The irresistible force of Thatcherite individualism ran headlong into the immovable object of a very entrenched Scottish sensibility. Mrs Thatcher might have thought that cautious, thoughtful, church-going Scotland might have been on her side. But when they heard what she made of the parable of the Good Samaritan, they seemed to say, it might mean that where you come from, but it doesn't mean that here. And you could hear the ties that bound the Anglo-Scottish Union creaking under the strain of it. When she'd finished speaking, the moderator of the General Assembly said to her, Prime Minister, I do believe that you may never before have been in one place where there are gathered together so many people who are praying for you. Days later, she was booed at the Scottish Cup final. Another attempt to stem the tide of conservative unpopularity ended in PR disaster. But as misjudgments go, this was nothing compared to what lay ahead. Most people agreed that the system for funding local authorities across the UK was unfair, unpopular and ripe for reform. The tax you were charged, called the rates, was based on the value of your house and not on your ability to pay. Scottish local authorities had been required by law to carry out a re-evaluation of house values. In other words, many people, especially if they lived in a big house, were about to be faced with a big tax hike. There had been a revaluation of rating, which itself seemed to be grossly unfair, and the government was under intense pressure, and particularly the Scottish office was under intense pressure from within Scotland to do something about it. The Tories had the solution, a flat rate tax. Everyone would pay the same. They called it the community charge. Everyone else called it the poll tax. Margaret Thatcher was captivated by the story of the, uh, the wee Scots wifey, the widow living at home in a big house, who was going to be hit by the revaluation and was going to be paying disproportionately more. And Margaret Thatcher thought of this sort of, you know, Sunday Post uh, reading lady in grief and thought how unfair it should be that she should have worked hard all her life and now be hit by this particular tax. Um, the poll tax seems to be fairer to me and it's certainly something that the Scottish party are asking me to do in order to resolve this problem. Fair enough. This is a Scottish solution to a Scottish problem. A sign actually that I'm taking seriously the need to be sensitive. And so for reasons that are if you're prepared, to be fair to her, entirely understandable, she and the Scottish Conservative Party made a catastrophic political mistake. The coincidence of that rates re-evaluation was the reason that the poll tax came to Scotland a year early. The Scottish Tory leadership had pressed for it to be brought. They thought it would be popular, a vote winner. But Scotland, already nursing a powerful grievance, didn't see it that way. For the poll tax, a year early, played straight into Scotland's now well-entrenched sense 
of its own victimhood. What was so nauseating and appalling and just insulting about the poll tax was that the Thatcher government decided to introduce it in Scotland first. They were using the people of Scotland as guinea pigs and it was almost as if the Tory Secretary of State for Scotland had offered uh, Scotland uh, on a plate. Guinea pigs, the shaming indignity of it, a proud nation diminished to the status of a laboratory rodent. It was perfect for Scotland's mounting sense of injustice. The guinea pig entered the national mythology. The truth is more prosaic. The reason it was introduced a year earlier in Scotland was nothing to do with Margaret Thatcher. George Younger and his colleagues in Scotland took the view that so, uh, so unpopular was the old rating system, the quicker they could get rid of it, the better. And because for technical reasons it was possible to introduce the poll tax earlier in Scotland than in England, the decision, uh, Margaret Thatcher and the cabinet were asked by George Younger, uh, we want policy agreement that we can in introduce it a year earlier. You're going to introduce it in England anyway. The one is not dependent on the other, but we would like to do it now rather than wait. And the cabinet said, if that's your judgment, by all means go ahead. Now, politically, it was, in retrospect, a very, very unwise thing to have done for all the reasons that uh, we are familiar with. But that's the background. It was not imposed on Scotland. It wasn't Thatcher's idea. It wasn't a, a trial or a guinea pig or any of that nonsense. That's all historically absurd. The community charge was not just a hated tax. It made Scotland confront its own powerlessness. When the bills appeared on the doormats, it brought the constitutional question, the democratic deficit, into every home in the land. The fundamental core of the thing was the emerging awareness of the enormous authority and power of what's sometimes referred to as the Crown and Parliament. That is the fact that a majority in Westminster, if such existed, and especially a substantial majority, could in fact drive policies which may be unpopular in very many sections of society and really could, really, could, really could suggest the emergence of a kind of electoral dictatorship. Because the kind of interventionism which was happening for Westminster by that time, by the late 80s, um, early 1990s, had never really occurred within the Union state since the um, immediate aftermath of the Jacobite Rebellion of the 1750s. It's to do with this cry which first went up, I think, in about 1981, about she hasn't got a mandate. You know. Most people in Scotland didn't vote for her. Um, at first, this didn't seem to be an important remark. Gradually, it did seem to be an important remark. And people began to say, yes, but Scotland is a political unit. It's a polity. It's a nation also in a political sense. And therefore, what its majority wants must count somewhere. It can't count for nothing. And we are getting a government we didn't vote for. I think it confirmed all the prejudices and grievances that people were already nursing about her. The the voice, the didactic approach to politics, the stridency, which seemed to be resented more in Scotland than in England, um, and the failure, of course, to recognise the merits of what she was doing and how it was transforming Scotland. So it, it, was, it was the culmination of all that. The poll tax was the last straw, I think, in many people's minds. In March 1990, on the eve of the tax being introduced in England and Wales, an anti-poll tax demonstration in London turned into the most violent riot that Britain had witnessed in decades. After ten years in power, the Conservative government had badly misread opinion in England as well as Scotland. Of course, the poll tax was hated across Britain, and if anything, the reaction was even angrier and certainly more violent here in England than it had been in Scotland. But in England, it was a revolt against a hated tax, against a single government policy. It didn't call into question the right of that government to govern at all. England at least had voted for it, and three times in a row. In Scotland, the poll tax revolt 
was something much bigger, more dangerous, more subversive, because it came to be seen as something that one country was imposing on another that had rejected it at the polls. And so for the first time since the 18th century, it was a direct challenge to the people sitting in that chamber over there to govern in Scotland at all. A direct challenge to the nature of the British state. The Prime Minister was mired in battles over Europe and the hated poll tax, and the party moved against her. A leadership challenge was launched, and on November the 28th, 1990, she left Downing Street. Just two days later, on St Andrew's Day, the Scottish Constitutional Convention published its blueprint for devolution. Post Thatcher, the Conservative vote continued to shrink in Scotland. They were wiped out at Westminster in 1997, and more than a decade later still send just one MP there. Their modest Scottish comeback has come through proportional representation in the Parliament they opposed. Looking around Scotland today, with what changes can we credit Margaret Thatcher? Come here now and you can still see the ghost of the old Scotland, the one that was to die in the 1980s, but it's not much more than a ghost now because one glance and you see how transformed it is. If you'd been here in 1979, you'd have been surrounded by the crashing turmoil of the industries that had made Scotland the country it was a country of real manufacturing muscle. Look at it now. It's a different place. It's not just a question of the closure of certain industries. It's a difference in the character of the country. You drive past a shipyard and the cranes and you knew this was a shipbuilding town. You drive through a mining village and you know from the, the winding gear at the top of the pit head uh, this is a mining town. Uh, you see Ravenscraig from miles away. Um, you don't have that sense anymore of the visual impact of this is what we do, this is who we are. The economy which replaced manufacturing was based on finance and services and until recently it made Scotland richer, but not everywhere. Well, many of the communities have, have still not recovered. There's still stats that show that in mining communities, you know, there's some greater problems in other places. Education attainment is less in some of them. Health is worse in some of these communities. So we're still suffering the repercussions of the closure, albeit so many years after it actually happened. I think one of the things was that many of the communities were totally reliant on the pit and isolated. And maybe when we look back in history, that might not have been such a good thing. It's very difficult, I think, for anyone in Scotland today to say that Margaret Thatcher was a positive force. She's become a sort of uh, bogey figure who is used to frighten children. She's the sort of figure who uh, hovers in the background whenever you play a uh, letter to America. She's the sort of person who's associated with the blighting of uh, Scotland's industrial heartland in the 1980s. But I think any rational assessment of Scotland now, if you look at the way in which owner occupation has become the norm in Scotland, if you look at the way in which aspiration has increased when it comes to education and more and more folk are going to university. All of that is a consequence of the economic changes that happened in the 1980s. Scotland's become a less chippy place, a more open country as a result of all the forces that were unleashed in the 1980s. If somebody asked me what good did Mrs. T do, uh, as a fisherman, she brought the salmon back to the Clyde because she closed all the blinking industry on either side of the Clyde and cleaned up the Clyde. So, you know, that, that, that was one good aspect about it. <laughs> that was accidental, though. <laughs> it was accidental. It wasn't intentional, no. <laughs> and what of the cohesiveness of the Anglo-Scottish Union? Since the Act of Union, Scotland's had a proud history as a distinctive nation within the United Kingdom. We in this party believe in a Scotland that continues to play a full part in the kingdom and on equal terms. The Thatcher years pulled Labour further down the road to devolution. The desire for a Scottish Parliament, once lukewarm, was now the settled popular will. Less than a decade after it first sat, the Scottish Parliament has a nationalist government, preparing for an independence referendum. Scotland's constitutional future is still unresolved. Is this, in the end, her legacy to Scotland?
I don't like to say I told you so, but the truth is that all the things that are happening and have happened since 1999, when the Assembly's Parliament started, uh, were things we predicted would happen. My own expected time scale was rather longer than uh, the speed with which it is happening. Um, we're not necessarily rollicking towards full, complete independence and separation from the rest of the United Kingdom, but we are moving rapidly towards a mindset that already treats the United Kingdom as fragmented. The back of Britain is already broken, and um, where it will end, I suspect, will be in some sort of cobbled together, botched up settlement of the kind that um, the United Kingdom has probably been built on over the centuries. Uh, it's not doing Scotland any good. It may make some Scots feel better, but it isn't doing them any good. There shall be a Scottish Parliament. I like that. If you talk to some Scottish Labour politicians, they make the point that devolution should have been sold as a rational way of bringing government closer to the people, rather than as an indulgence of nationalist feeling. Now, they might say that it was because of Margaret Thatcher's insensitivity that they were driven to it. I can understand that argument. But I think in the interests of honesty, we have to recognize that uh, Margaret Thatcher and Donald Dewar together were the godparents of the Scottish Parliament, and responsibility rests on both their shoulders. I'm sure Margaret Thatcher would be distraught uh, to, to think of her uh, impact on Scotland in, in these terms. It certainly was unintended. Godmother, uh, like Godfather, I, I think probably the general view in the Scottish Parliament, the general view in Scotland is that as much distance between Margaret Thatcher and the Scottish Parliament, <laughs> probably the better. Uh, so Godmother, certainly not fairy Godmother. The campaign for a Scottish Parliament has been around well, since the Treaty of Union, certainly for a century as a serious political force. But what Margaret Thatcher did as an unintended consequence is by the nature of her policies on the economy, on social life in Scotland, on the poll tax. She, made, she turned the Scottish Parliament from being a, a nice idea, a democratic advance, into being something that was absolutely essential to defend the country against the policies of Margaret Thatcher or someone like her. Mrs Thatcher was no ordinary politician. She was the hurricane that blew through the post-war British consensus. Scotland fiercely resisted the transforming power of her but emerged transformed despite itself. The Scottish Parliament is now the fixed and undisputed centre of public life in Scotland, but it grew out of the consensus that was forged in opposition to her. She didn't want it. She warned that it would lead to the breakup of Britain. But she created the conditions that brought it into being. That was the Thatcher paradox, that the woman we conjured up as the unloved, wicked stepmother turned out to be godparent. To the new Scotland. Think of the country that Margaret Thatcher inherited as Prime Minister. We were all children of the post-war settlement, of cradle-to-grave welfare, of the pursuit of full employment. The British state was still making steel, digging coal, building ships. It installed your telephone, it supplied the electricity that lit your home and the gas you cooked with. Now all those things are done if they're done at all, not by the British state, but by the market. What happened to Scotland under Margaret Thatcher was not so much the resurgence of a new Scottish national identity, though that was part of the story too. What happened was the steady falling away of much that it had meant to be British. The steady falling away of the shared experience of Britishness in Scotland. Mrs Thatcher believed in Britain with a clear-eyed shining passion. She believed in the Union, but she became the means by which Scots reimagined and then reinvented their place within it. That is the real paradox of Scotland and Hurricane Maggie.